All right, so let's pick up um, on concentric and eccentric contractions. Um, here are two graphs that just illustrate that eccentric contractions are generate more force than concentric contractions, or more torque rather. And then isometric is in the middle. So here's the moment of force or torque versus angle diagram. Eccentric is the highest, followed by isometric, followed by concentric. Again, if you remember from the first video, we are weakest during our concentric contractions. Another way to look at this is through looking at muscle activation or EMG activity, which we'll measure in a few weeks in lab, versus the force. So if you say at a constant force, which contraction has more muscle activation? eccentric or concentric. And you can see here at the same flexor force, concentric needs more muscle activation than eccentric. Another way to look at this is to, to go the same mileage, concentric needs more gas than eccentric. Eccentric is very fuel efficient. If you're fuel efficient, you will be able to go longer or generate more force. Um, if you hold the muscle activation constant, at a certain muscle activation, you can generate less flexor force during a concentric contraction than you can during an eccentric contraction. So again, eccentric, we are stronger than we are during a concentric contraction. A few other definitions, agonist muscles. Those are the muscles that um, cause the movement of a body segment. So if you're doing an elbow flexion exercise, your agonists are your biceps brachii, brachialis. Muscle, multiple muscles contribute to the movement. And as I said, for elbow flexion, you have your brachialis and your biceps brachii. Some assisting muscles could be your brachioradialis and the extensor carpi radialis longus. Antagonists are the muscle action opposite of the motion. And for most motions, you want that to be very quiet, right? You don't want any antagonist um, torque acting on you. So typically, these muscles passively elongate or shorten. Um, for skillful movement, there's no tension in the antagonist muscles. Um, they can um, be used as controlling or braking forces after, say, a, a, a maximal motion. Um, one other thing I want to say about antagonists is typically, you know, if you start um, any sort of new activity, a lot of times there's a lot of co-contraction, and usually that co-contraction, in, in particular the, the contraction of the antagonist muscle, decreases so your movement becomes more fluid. Stabilizers. They stabilize a body part. Pretty straightforward. Um, your rotator cuff are huge stabilizers, right? Keeping that um, humeral head and that glenoid fossa. Rhomboid stabilizes scapula during arm movements, right? All your, your six um, scapular muscles keep that scapula on your thorax while your glenohumeral joint is moving. Great ranges of motion. You can also have something called the neutralizer. The neutralizer eliminates unwanted action produced by an agonist. So your pronator teres prevents supination of the forearm during contraction of the biceps brachii. So your pronator teres pronates, all right, so that's the neutralizer. And what are the functions of your biceps brachii? It flexes the glenohumeral joint, flexes the elbow joint, and is also a supinator. So do, if you don't want that supination motion when you engage your biceps brachii, you will also engage your pronator teres to prevent that motion. And then you'll only get elbow flexion and or glenohumeral flexion. Two joint muscles are very important, especially when we get to the force length curve. Biceps brachii is at technically a three joint muscle, which we just discussed being a um, crossing the glenohumeral joint, the elbow joint, and the radial ulnar joint. Your triceps brachii, the long head is a two-joint muscle, so it is a glenohumeral extensor and an elbow extensor.
your hamstring muscles cross the hip joint, they are hip extensors, and they also cross the knee joint as knee flexors. Rectus femoris is a hip flexor and a knee extensor. And one thing about two joint muscles uh -huh, um, is that you can either put them in an excessively lengthened position so you, and that's usually the position where quote unquote, you stretch those muscles. So for hamstrings, if you extend your knee and flex your hip, you are lengthening the hamstring muscles, or you can put them into excessively shortened position. For the hamstring, that would be hip extension and knee flexion. Which gets into something called active insufficiency. So contracting at extreme ranges of motion, typically in a shortened position. So if you um, flex your knee and plantar flex your ankle, you put that gastrocnemius in a very shortened position to the point that it cannot, its activation is not very sufficient or it is in active insufficiency. And then since it can't really generate a lot of force and say you do a, some sort of exercise, it, that, that exercise would then focus on the soleus. So if you do a standing heel raise versus a seated heel raise, the standing heel raise will focus on your gastrocnemius. The seated heel raise will focus on your soleus. Another um, practical application of active insufficiency is your, are your finger flexors during wrist flexion. Um, so if you flex your wrist joint and excessively, right, as far as you can, and you try to flex your fingers or make form a fist, you will not be able to do that. So this is a position used sometimes in um, self-defense or martial arts to, to have somebody not be able to grip something or to drop something. All right, a few other things about muscle activation. Um, you can have isokinetic movement, which is constant velocity of contraction. And there are isokinetic machines, um, they, and they can test you both concentric and eccentrically. They're very interesting. You don't change the load on them. You just change the velocity, either a slow velocity or a fast velocity. And we'll discuss the effect of velocity on contraction level or force production uh, during a contraction when we get to the force velocity curve. Some machines, isokinetic machines, are Cybex or Kincom machines. You might have seen them in clinics that you were working with. Isotonic is a constant load throughout contraction. So that's when we pick up a, um, a dumbbell um, or any sort of weight. It, is, it does not change its, its load during the contraction phase. So again, free weights. The torque changes throughout the motion, though. Keep that in mind, because always remember, torque is the force times the external moment arm. So that external moment arm changes all the time. The load does not. So the load is constant. The torque changes. All right, and then to finish up, just to bring back um, uh, vector resolution, all of our muscles, and I think I mentioned this, um, have a rotary and a stabilizing component because they are angled. They have attachment points at two ends. So let's look at the difference between the rotary and stabilizing components of the brachioradialis and of the biceps brachii. Which muscle can contribute more to a flexing, to flexing the elbow joint? So we have our fulcrum, and we have the line of action of our biceps brachii. And so here's the line of action of our biceps brachii. And so we have a very short, if we resolve this into the horizontal and vertical components, very short horizontal or stabilizing component, a large rotary component. Whoop. And then if we look at the brachioradialis, which is at a shallower angle, and resolve that into its horizontal and vertical components, do we have a much larger stabilizing component? So that muscle pulls the... Um, uh, humerus into the radius and ulna, and it has um, less of the force production going into the rotation or um, flexing of the elbow joint. Um, again, does the rotator cuff rotate the glenohumeral joint? Okay, based on all these angles of the rotator cuff muscles, they're at a very um, 
uh, low angle, so a lot of their force is going horizontally or acting as stabilizers rather than rotating this glenohumeral joint. The deltoid is at a bit much better advantage and vector resolution of having more of its force go to rotation than to um, stabilization. And that's it.